Hey, howdy everybody. This is lecture number three from my graduate level course in subsurface modeling. And for those of you who followed my undergraduate course in data analytics, geostatistics and machine learning, that's also been posted on YouTube. You will remember this lecture is lecture number two from that set of lectures. And I covered it there with greater detail with a bit of a different focus and I gave it in a more condensed version for my graduate level students to make sure that we're all on the same page. Do I do that? Because in order to build a model in a setting that is as uncertain as the subsurface, we need to deal with probability. Probability is extremely important. We make all of our decisions when we face uncertainty by assessing probabilities. We would not drill a well if there was not a sufficiently high chance or probability of success. We would not replace a valve unless there was a significantly high probability the valve is cracked and is going to fail. Of course, the decision is always based on the consequences too. There's a decision to make. If we, if we all go ahead and acquire a seismic survey, we would want to know the probability of that survey identifying a reservoir or maybe some important features about the reservoir. That right there is the value of information of the seismic that can allow us to make a good choice about whether or not we go ahead and acquire that seismic survey and so forth and so on. There's many decisions that we make and we use probability to make the choice. Most of our decisions in the subsurface have uncertainty often large degrees of uncertainty. By quantifying probability, we can make better decisions indeed. And so I take you back to just a couple lectures ago when we talked about the overall reservoir modeling workflow, where we're building a set of models that represent uncertainty in the subsurface scenarios and realizations. We apply them to the transfer function and we get some form of a decision criteria by which we're able to make a decision. And so you could imagine that for every step within this workflow, probability is central. When we're building up the multiple realizations, scenarios, we have to make decisions about the modeling parameters, their uncertainty ranges, their probability density functions. Local probabilities of occurrence. If you want to build up a trend model or you calibrate some type of secondary information into a soft constraint, you'll be dealing directly with the probability of sand or shale or high porosity or low permeability or whatever it might be. Discrete scenarios. If we have multiple scenarios that are different, unique from each other, we would want to consider the probability of each of them occurring. We don't want to maybe say they're all equally likely. Maybe it's more likely channelized, less likely lobate, and so forth. And if we're dealing with multiple realizations, we may make a decision of equal probable realizations, or we may put some type of weighting on them based on maybe match to production data and so forth. And so here's probabilities again. We apply all of these models that uncertainty model, the suite of or ensemble of models representing the subsurface to our transfer function to calculate that decision criterion that can relate directly to profitability, dollars, the, whatever the criteria is, production rates that we need in order to make our choice. And so then we would have a resulting PDF of that decision criterion and we would be considering the probability of exceeding a threshold, probability of having positive economics, whatever it might be. The entire workflow, I hope I convinced you, is based on probability. And so what does that mean? We can't proceed further into subsurface modeling without making sure we're all on the same page with regard to probability. So how is probability defined? The answer, it depends how you look at it. What is your frame of reference? If you take a frequentist perspective, then the answer is you do counting. As shown by this equation right here, the probability of occurrence of event A is simply going to be the ratio of the number of times that you observe A occurring divided by the total number of observations. Now, of course, we put a limit here of number of observations approaching infinity. And what are we representing there? We're suggesting that it's very dangerous 
to assess probability from too few samples. That's commonly known as the fallacy of the belief in the law of small numbers. And what we see is that you often need a large number of observations to really understand probability with any type of certainty. And so we see that we can simply count our way in order to get to a probability. Look up multiple wells. How many times did porosity exceed 15%? Look at the seismic image. How often did it exceed a certain level of acoustic impedance? And so forth. It's all about counting. Now, not all problems can be solved with counting. And so we need multiple frames of reference to be able to deal with these different types of problems. And so what is the Bayesian approach to probability? It's a measure of likelihood that event will occur in which we accept that the probability of occurrence can be interpreted as a reasonable likelihood representing your state of knowledge or a quantification of personal belief. You start with a prior and then you update with new information. And so that's the fundamental idea of Bayesian approaches, that you accept that belief can be a reasonable avenue to get to probability. Of course, when we say belief, we acknowledge scientifically it involves expert judgment, expert observation, expert experience, and so forth. We're not suggesting belief in a soft manner. And we also acknowledge the fact that we have to build some type of prior probability, and we then update with new information as we go to get a posterior probability. The concept of updating with new information is quite powerful. Now, I won't spend any more time right now on Bayesian approaches. I'm going to go frequentist for the next, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes or so. We'll get back and record another video in which we'll get into the concepts of Bayesian probabilities. Okay, so let's start with frequentist notions. I should make a comment as a move forward though. There's many of classes of problems for which cannot be solved with both methods. In fact, having in your toolkit frequentist and Bayesian methodologies for probability is a very powerful combination. We will outline different types of problems later on that can be solved very well with Bayesian methodologies, but would be quite difficult, if not impossible, with standard frequentist type of approaches. If we're going to talk about probability, a very useful vehicle for communicating probability is the concept of a Venn diagram. Many have seen Venn diagrams before. I won't dive too much into it or spend too much time discussing it. Suffice it to say that with a Venn diagram, you have some type of omega area that represents all possible outcomes, and you have simply then drawn regions representing specific cases or events, event A, event B. So if you look at this, what's the probability of event B occurring relative to the probability of A? And the answer is B is more likely. It's a larger area. What's the probability of A and B occurring together? Never happens. They don't overlap with each other. So it's a very powerful method to communicate concepts of probability. And so you can go ahead and explore different Venn diagrams. You can look at relative sizes of them. You can look at overlap areas and so forth. But let me go ahead and talk about fundamental probability logic, the rules of probability. The first is the union operator. This is the idea of the or, the probability of A or B happening. We show it as the union or U symbol right here, A or B occurring. A union with B occurring are all cases for which we have A events or B events. In the Venn diagram, we would simply shade in A, the intersection of A and B, and B as being all of this union of A and B. If you were in a drawing program, it'd be like the weld operator where you can weld things together. Intersection of events. This is the idea of A and B occurring jointly. It's our joint probability of A and B, an AND operator. And so we show it with this symbol right here. I remember as A intersection, I think N, it looks like an N. That's the way I remember that. So in the Venn diagram, it's the purple area, A intersection with B. Complementary. Well, if A can occur, A cannot occur too. And so A complement 
is the probability of A not occurring. If you have an omega area here, which is all possible outcomes, A is shown here, everything, everything that's not in A is a complement. Mutually exclusive events are ones for which the intercept, intersection sorry, of them is a null set. There are no cases in which you have both happening at the same time. As we'll state later, the joint probability is equal to zero. Exhaust the mutually exclusive sequence of events. Well, if I have A and a B event and they are exhaustive, that means that A and B fill the entire realm of possibility that there should be no part of this Venn diagram that is white in color. It should all be colored. Mutually exclusive suggests that they don't overlap with each other. And so this would be an example of A and B events which are exhaustive and mutually exclusive with each other. And of course, things can get much more complicated now that we've gone through some probability logic with intercept, intersections or joints, and also with unions, we can start talking about some more types of complicated descriptions of events. We've got three different events shown here on our Venn diagram, C, B, and A. And we can start talking about the probability of A complement intersected or jointly with B, intersected with C. And so now we're talking about the shaded area right here within our Venn diagram. Now, of course, you could create sets of values, a sample space, and then you could define certain events by thresholds as shown here. And then you could start finding the subset of the samples that satisfy these specific operators. And I won't go through this right now in detail, but you would find here I think I might have an error here somewhere. Someone should remind me or comment. I can't remember where it was, but in general, this should be pretty good. And then, of course, you can calculate the probabilities. We're frequentists right now. We take the perspective of frequentists. And so we simply just count. If we have three of the samples meet the criteria of being an event A, the probability of A is three divided by the total number of samples, three divided by seven. Probabilities by counting and ratios. Very straightforward. Now, we can talk a little bit about non-negativity and normalization. Fundamental probability constraints exist. We know that probability is bounded. We should never have a probability that's negative and never have a probability that's greater than one. That would be impossible. That would effectively end the universe, kidding aside. Okay, now, closure. That is the probability of all outcomes must be equal to one. If we look at all the possibilities, it should satisfy this constraint. The null sets means that we're identified a constraint for which it never happens, at least not in our sample set. And so we deem it has a zero probability. Complementary events have closure. Closure means that the probability of being a complement plus the probability of A must be equal to one. When we get into conditionals, we'll find other closure um, relationships that are quite powerful and helpful to us. The addition rule. This is a common fallacy, is that when people use the OR operator or the union operator, they forget that there's an issue with double counting. And so if we use the union between A and B, the probability of A or B, it is the summation of the probability A plus the probability of B, but if we don't subtract the probability of joint A and B, we will be double dipping, double accounting for this intersected area. Now, in the case of mutually exclusive events, they don't overlap, so the addition rule simplifies. We don't have to consider any intersections. We can once again just sum all of the probabilities. Now, you can prove some of these things to yourself, the unions, the intersections, and so forth, by just taking a data set with porosity, permeability, drawing some regions, and counting. Frequentist approach again, we can just count. And so you could go through this problem and do some of this counting shown right here. And so let's move on to conditional probability. You can go ahead and pause and work through that previous example if you like to. Conditional probability. This is the probability of B event occurring given A already occurred. How do we calculate that? We can actually calculate it by the ratio of the joint probability of A and B occurring, the intersection, 
divided by the probability of A. How do you think about this? One way I think about this that works very well for myself is this idea that we have omega region with all possible outcomes, but we know that A already occurred. So we have to take our universe from omega and shrink it to A. We're shrinking the space to A because A occurred. All possible outcomes going forward have to be within A now. So if we shrink, and now I want to know the probability of B given A occurred, it's just the ratio of this intersection between the two divided by the area of A. Now, of course, the concept of conditional probabilities are very powerful. Conditional probabilities, marginal probabilities, joint probabilities. A way that I like to look at it is I like to think about this idea of a um, bivariate or two variable setting, permeability, porosity, and I could come up with some type of criteria. I could talk about porosity being between, let's say, 25 and 27 percent. This area right here represented by phi 2. Well, I could calculate that I could count the number of times porosity exceeds or, or sits within that bin. And if I divide by all possible samples, we could agree that that would be the probability of that omega, that phi 2, I should say, which would be a marginal probability. It's just a single variable probability. Now, if I take the region in porosity, phi 2 criteria, and I take a K1 criteria over here, and so now I have a square, porosity between 25 and 25, 7%, permeability maybe between 100 and 130 millidarcies or something like that. Then I take all of the samples that lie in that square and I divide by all of the samples in total, that would be a joint probability. That's the intersection of two possible events. Now, if I take region phi 1, maybe it's porosity between 8 and 10%, and I calculate the distribution of permeabilities within that bin, that would be a conditional distribution. I've shrunk my universe. I'm only considering a certain range of porosities. And then I could calculate any set of porosity, I mean permeability, conditional probabilities relative to or conditional to being within this porosity bin. And so that's how I like to visualize the idea of a marginal probability, a joint probability, and a conditional probability where I shrunk my universe to a condition. All right, so now in the notation we use moving forward, we'll represent marginal probabilities. There's simply going to be a probability for given one event or one variable at a time. And so we'll just represent them as probability x, y as we have previously. Conditional probabilities, we could either say probability x given y, or we'll often use the, the vertical line to indicate that we have a probability of x given y. We read that line as given. Joint probabilities, we'll often use and, intersection, or just the comma if we're feeling a little bit more kind of efficient or lazy. I have recorded a YouTube video at this link down below, which has, I don't know, maybe a 10 minute discussion on the conditional joint marginal probabilities and distributions and with an example showing how you would calculate them and move between from a conditional to a joint to a marginal and so forth. How do you integrate and move between them? So this might be helpful to you. Now, of course, things can get more complicated. What about conditional probabilities when you're dealing with three different events? The conditional probability of C given B and A occurred. Well, we can calculate it with these two sets of joints. The probability of A, intersection B, intersection C, the joint A, B, and C occurring, divided by the probability of A intersection with B. Now, you remember we already had calculated the conditional probability or shown it for this intersection of A and B. We can take A on the other side and substitute here we now get this equation right here. This is pretty cool because now I can take this denominator, put it on the left-hand side, 
and we'll find that the joint A, B, and C can be solved for as the probability of C given B and A times the probability B given A times the probability of A. This is a general form of con using conditionals to get a joint with recursion. It's very powerful because we can calculate this joint probability with our three events without having to actually calculate any joints. We do it all with these conditionals. This is often much easier. The full form is shown right here, and we do it all the time. In Gaussian simulation, we in fact use the recursion method to be able to proceed in a sequential manner to simulate what would be impossible to simulate directly, to draw directly from the joint distribution at 10 million cells in a model at once would be impossible really, but we can do it in a sequential manner using this concept of conditionals and recursion. Okay, more on conditional probabilities. As I promised, there's closure even in conditionals. Remember, if we shrunk our universe to B, now we could say that the probability of A given B plus the probability of A complement given B must also be equal to one. We shrunk to B, so now we're talking about the probability of A given B plus the probability of not A given B must be equal to one because our universe has shrunk with the conditional. Okay. Now I think these two Venn diagrams provide a nice opportunity to test your knowledge. So go ahead and pause this video and just try working this out to test your knowledge. Yeah, I'll give you the answer in three, two, one. So what's in the first case, case one, what's the probability of A given B? Well, in the numerator, we will have the joint. No matter how what we're solving, which one will have the joint. The probability of A and B intersect with B. What is that? That's equal to zero. They're mutually exclusive of each other. So in both of these cases, this will be equal to zero. How about this case right here? Super interesting. Probability of A given B. Ah, interesting. So the intersection of A and B in this case is going to be equal to the probability of B. B is completely inside of A. And so in this case, well, the probability of B over the probability of B, it's one. The probability of B given A is interesting too, because in this case, we're dealing with the intersection between A and B is once again still equal to B, but in the denominator, we're going to have the probability of A, so it's gonna be the ratio of the two. And so this is it shown right here, and you can see the solutions as I just stated them. I provide another example right here where we draw some lines, we make some cases, event A and B based on thresholds and porosity and permeability, and you can go ahead and work out some conditional probabilities. Prove your knowledge. Also, here's a table right here where we have binned up the data, we had some scatter plot, and we record it within each conditional bin, the number of data within each one of them. And so you can go ahead and calculate a range of different statistics from this example. You can convert them all into joint probabilities just simply by taking these frequencies, one, divide by the total number of samples, and you come back and you get 4%. So it must have been 25 samples within this data set. And when we had two samples, of course, we'll have 8% and so forth. Then, of course, you can go ahead and calculate the marginal distributions. How would you do that? Well, to get the marginal and fraction of shale, you just have to sum over or integrate over the porosity to get that marginal. And so I also show how to calculate the conditional shrinking your universe. You can work through these two. The multiplication rule. And so we've already seen this. This was the calculation of conditional probability where we just took the denominator out and put it on the left. Left on the, In this case, we put it all on the right-hand side, and we got the joint equal to the conditional times the marginal. Now, we can use this. This is quite interesting because if the events A and B are independent of each other, the probability of B given A is simply equal to the probability of B. If they're independent, A doesn't tell you anything about B. And so probability B given A is not affected. It's the same as the probability of B. And so we can substitute that into this equation. And so if something's independent, we can say that the joint is equal to the probability of A joint B or A and B is equal to the probability of B times the probability of A. 
The general form, of course, you could have many different cases. It would just be the product sum of all of them together. So here's an example right here. I won't work through this. You're welcome to pause it, but it's very simple to work out these probabilities. Now, this leads to a couple of conditions we can use to test for independence. If we have independence, the probability of A intercept or jointly with B is equal to the probability of B times the probability of A. Now we can also look at the conditional forms that we already stated, probability of A given B is equal to probability A, and the reverse, B and A, B given A is equal to B. And so you can go ahead and take an example like this where we have faces 1, 2, and 3, and 10 wells, and we have them at different subsections, a top, a middle, and a bottom subsection, or I should say a subunit within this reservoir. And you go ahead and try to work out whether or not certain events, F1 being in the middle, or F3 faces being in the bottom, if they're independent of each other. That would be very interesting because then you can assess, if you suspect they're independent, you may decide to model each one of these subsections independently, or maybe the subsections or the subunits provide information about each other, you can test for it. Now, these methods of testing, of course, are not sufficient to prove independence, but you could suspect independence and make the decision to proceed assuming independence by performing these types of tests. Let me go ahead. What I'll do is I'll leave these probability trees and so forth for you to go through. I also have the more exhaustive lecture, lecture number two, I believe it was from my previous undergraduate level course. I'm going to stop right here and I will start another video where I will dive into the Bayesian approach and talk about Bayesian statistics. I hope that this was useful. As we move along in the course and we construct our subsurface modeling workflows, I will continue to identify probability. We will continue to use these types of approaches in order to make our workflows stronger, to ensure that we do a good job of managing probability so that we make good decisions with those probabilities. All right, I hope this was useful to you. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. And I hope that this was helpful. Of course, you can reach out to me through questions to these videos in YouTube. I'm also the Geostats guy on Twitter, and I'm super easy to find if you want my contact. I also do a lot of teaching within companies. I also consult and um, conduct research collaboratively with companies all the time. Reach out to me if you want to get some help with building your workflows or you want opportunities to participate in research to provide deliverables that can help your company, your group, or your consortium, and so forth. All right, I hope it was helpful. Bye.